This is um, actually the third part of a series on building the church. Um, and perhaps uh, the last one to specifically deal with it, maybe one more. And I've been enjoying doing it, and I hope you've enjoyed listening and hopefully learning some things, or at least raising some questions in your, your own thoughts and contemplation. 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 5 through 9, those verses, sum down to, uh, we water a plant, but God causes growth. If we talk church growth, and I'm a person who's studied church growth and lived church growth all my life, we're aware that God causes growth. As I said in session one, uh, the, the key to church growth is prayer, prayer, prayer. But obviously, uh, it's more than prayer as well. Archbishop William Temple said, to evangelize is to so present that Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit that men and women shall come to put their faith in God through him, to accept him as their savior and to serve him as their king in the fellowship of a church. Now, all of us, I think, desire, especially pastors, to grow the church. I think if you ask members of your congregation, if you're a pastor listening to this, you know, people say, would you like your church to grow? They would say yes. And I think uh, that desire is there, and, um, and they pray. I don't know a pastor who doesn't pray for his church to grow, for people to come, for folks to know the Lord, and yet many there's no growth. And so we have to ask why, and at least come uh, to understand that desire is not enough. If that's all that was necessary, then every church in the world would be a mega church, or at least larger than they are now. So, so every Christian has, like prayer itself, everyone has the desire to pray. If you're a Christian, you have a desire to pray, pray. and yet we know that prayer, regular prayer, is, is difficult. It's difficult, like going to the gym. You know, we desire to get on that treadmill. We desire to get on that stationary bike. We desire to, to walk a mile or two miles a day. The desire's there. Usually comes very late at night just before you're ready to go to bed. The desire is there. Now, tomorrow, tomorrow I'm going to do this. But what's lacking What's lacking? Why doesn't it happen? Why isn't prayer more frequent among uh, Christians? Is uh, they won't embrace the discipline of prayer. Because, see, discipline has the same root word as the word disciple. A disciple is, is a disciplined follower. It's a disciple is one who's taken desire and moved it denying self and picking up their cross and following Jesus. And desire that gives uh, way to discipline, both in prayer and in actions, makes things happen. Understand that uh, if you're embracing the planting and watering that Scripture calls for you, there's going to be hard changes, both in yourself and in your congregation. What I'm talking about is not easy. It's not fun. It's work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of God. And we must work to get the congregation and ourselves to change. And the way we get change to take place is we change in ourselves. We start with ourselves. Old prayer by Bishop Y.Y. Y. Su, who was a Chinese Anglican bishop, who prayed, Lo, Lord, renew the church and begin with me. The resistance to changing the way things are and done is the primary obstacle to evangelism and to church growth. Because most often the things that need changing are things that have been established by man, not necessarily by God, and have been given much more emphasis than they were ever expected to give. It's the way things are, the way things are done. 
So it's not really the tradition of a church. Uh, um, it's the traditions. It's, a, it's those little things that we do that if they've been done more than once become the way it's always been done. A move of the Holy Spirit in a church messes that up. And it can become disturbing to some people. But change is necessary. Change is a part of growth. I'm thankful that I'm not the same person I was when I was 19 or 30 or 40 or even 50. That God has worked in me and changes have taken place for the better, I think. Change is necessary. And that change, as with everything in the church, is going to grow out of relationship. It's relational. It's a relationship with God. It's relationship with each other. And as the pastor disciplines himself in prayer and evangelism, if he, he forms that relationship with God and, and disciplines himself, then the sons and daughters will follow. The pattern will be set. It's been said that a pastor cannot bring about revival, renewal, or evangelism. But what a pastor can do is block it and even stop it by his or her willingness to not change. The pastor must be willing to change for growth to occur. And that change occurs out of his relationship in prayer and his discipleship, his discipline. I think that's what it means that the anointing flows from the head down. Growing churches have growing pastors, men of prayer, men of discipline, who have a biblical plan and a pattern for growth. In other words, there's a they, they're clear on where they're going and they're going to do what they're going to do. That plan is biblical and it comes from God. And, uh, and then it's explained and so that everyone knows the plan. Everyone knows where we're going. And, and God's people know uh, God's intention and that they all come to the knowledge of him and are added, that all come to the knowledge of him, and then God will let, add to our numbers. That that's God's intention. The congregation should know that. People should know that. And if we've got that in place, if we look at that, if, as I a pastor, I've set those, those um, guidelines, those tracks, then we can expect God to give growth. And we live in the ex expectation of that. I think expectation has a lot to do sometimes with the move of the Spirit. I, not that the expectation makes it happen, but without the expectation, we miss what's happening. We miss what God is doing because we're looking at other things. But God is ready. God wants to send us people. God wants to see every church, I believe, filled to come to the saving knowledge of him. And so we can expect God to add to our numbers. And I'll say this over and over again. Listen to me. This is so critical. As you expect God to add to our numbers, as you, as you sat yourself down, you're praying, you're, you're um, disciplining yourself in prayer, in reading, the numbers, the people, the numbers to be added are not in your church right now. They're not in your church. In fact, the fastest growing group of religious people in the United States are people who have no affiliation with a church and do not go to church. Now, let me suggest they believe in God. It might not be a biblical understanding of God, but they believe in God. And they also believe in prayer. They believe we can connect with a power greater than ourselves or a power who created us. But they're not in the church. 
And what we see in most church growth today is what's called transfer growth. In fact, in the last decade in America, not only has there been no church growth, the numbers are decreasing. With all the evangelism, all the TV evangelism, radio evangelism, street evangelism that's going on, the church has actually decreased in numbers. So what I'm saying is, is there's got to be a plan for growth. In other words, we've got to water and plan. But also, let me repeat it again. Growth occurs with people who are not in your church. And many of them have no understanding. Listen to me, no understanding of what the church is. And in many cases, the only information they have about the church comes from not the church, but the secular world or by people who have been hurt by the church. So we need to be establishing relationships with people who are not in church. And perhaps the worst way we can establish a relationship with anybody is to tell them how horrible they are and that they're going to hell. I mean, if you approach me that way, I wouldn't talk to you. In fact, I would do everything I could to get away from you. But we're to establish that relationship, and relationships are established out of friendship, out of commonality. So the ministry of evangelism or church growth or relationships <laughs> is central to our call. And, and if we look at the church and say we're going to establish relationships with people who are not in the church, is everybody involved in that process? Is money made available, resources made available to do that? Are people aware of uh, what uh, evangelism is all about? Or is it still a scary word to them? Have we defined it? How do we witness to Christ and to their friends? How do we do that? Establishing uh, a relationship. How do we talk about Jesus uh, with people who don't know him? See, the ways to invite people first are not to the church, but to friendship. Friendship is, is, is the fastest way. Friendship is the fastest way to get to a person's heart. Dinner, home visits, sporting events, things that people do together. And in that, in that people get to know, not theology, but they get to know the Christ that is in you, that what makes you different. You become the witness. It's why home groups are so effective, not only for discipleship, but also for evangelism. The three streams of convergence, uh, the evangelical, liturgical, and charismatic stream that flow into to a mighty river, are not three separate streams. The liturgy uh, is historic and ancient and uses ancient and historic signs and symbols. But the liturgy is also evangelical. If he be lifted up, all men will be drawn to him. Behold the Lamb of God. It's also charismatic, beyond what music. Music does not make charismatic. There should be great music, but there should not only be openness and expectation of the prophecy and words of knowledge and prayer be made available, with anointing with oil. There should be an understanding that the most charismatic of the liturgy is the epiclesis, or the time when we pray Holy Spirit, come down upon this bread and wine and may turn it into the body and blood of Jesus. I believe personally that everything on Sunday morning should point to this moment and then to the distribution of the bread and wine to the people. Now that we have really, I mean, really been in the presence of the Lord Jesus on Sunday, let us go forth, let us go forth for the Misa, the dismissal, into the world. 
those three events come together to one mighty river and move us out to become friends in relationship with people around us. And we can invite people into our friendship with Jesus and then invite people to the Eucharist because it's inviting people to Jesus. There's several events in the CEC liturgy for us, but I also uh, believe for those who, who come and need to come to church to experience where the charismatic is at work strongly and they're liturgical events. What better, what better moment in this world right now than the confession of sin? Which I believe should be at the beginning of the liturgy, not in the middle or as a response to a sermon. And I believe we use the first person and make it personal. We've created there, not in a charismatic moment, but an evangelical moment. Listen to this prayer. Almighty and most merciful Father, I have erred and strayed from your ways like a lost sheep. I have followed too much the devices and desires of my own heart. I have offended against your holy laws, and I have left undone those things which I ought to have done, and I have done those things which I ought not to have done. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon me. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. What a great moment for people who are broken or hurting or struggling or believe they've offended God or God is angry at them or whatever, so to separate them to, to sounds like a prayer you can give at an altar call. And then the power of, of hearing the words, Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you your sins. Forgive you your sins. There's other moments in the liturgy, the creed, when we can opportunity to confess our faith and, uh, and make visible the king and the kingdom. That's the aim of worship. That's charismatic, evangelical, and liturgical. To make visible the king who loves us, and who wants everyone to come to the saving knowledge of him and have eternal life. And since our worship is a central act of the church, that, that we may worship him on the holy mountain, that we're called out of the bondage of sin to worship him and be drawn into the throne room of God. That's the intent of all men and women to be loved by God and to love God. So what about visitors? We're, that's where the population, that where our church is going to grow. Visitors to our Sunday morning will be impacted, as we are, by the signs and the symbols of the kingdom. And so we need to examine, if we're a church seeking growth, we need to examine what do the signs and symbols in our church convey? What does the visitor see with his eyes, smell with his nose, hears with his ears, touch with his hands when he comes to our church? Making a church visitor-friendly is not making a church seeker-friendly. Visitor-friendly is merely asking the question, what does a visitor know about Christ and the kingdom when he or she enters the church? Are half of the congregation in clerical collars looking like a private men's club? Are there children and families? How does the church respond to those children? Are the symbols clear, and can they be communicated? Can the visitor get through the liturgy without feeling like he or she has landed on another planet, but they can participate? Is the king and the kingdom central to the message from blessed be God all the way to go forth into the world? Is the sermon understandable 
Is it a psychological message? A how-to message? Or is it about Jesus and the kingdom? The grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, about eternal life. Is it clear what we have to offer? And is this something we need? Is it meeting that spiritual emptiness? As J.B. Phillips said, it's meeting that hole that can be filled only by God. Visitor friendly does not mean giving up any one of the streams. We want to, we want to embrace, and in fact, I, I believe we need to enhance the three streams, but as one mighty river. And I'll talk about that down the road. Even the preaching of God's word should draw us always to who do people say that Jesus is? What does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God? What does it mean practically? What does it mean right now? Wherever I am, whether it's Rwanda or, or Jersey City or South Carolina or Manila or Kalibo, what does it mean that Jesus is the Son of God and to live in his kingdom? What does it mean to deny myself and pick up my cross and follow Jesus? And how do I do that in New York and Georgia and California and Nairobi, Tallinn? How do I do that in my family and in my role as a parent or husband? How do I live that out if I'm single? What does it mean Jesus is Lord? And how does that impact my eternity? Jesus is Lord, so what? Jesus is Lord, how do I follow? Jesus is Lord, what do I need to do? Is that communicated? It is God's will that all men and women come to the knowledge of him. That's really the basis of evangelism, not, not Matthew 28, although Matthew 28 is a, is a mission statement. It's to the knowledge of him. So does our music talk about ourselves or about who he is? You see, I'm asking a lot of questions that a church can ask, a rector's council can ask, a group can ask. See, are we singing to ourselves like a karaoke night following the bouncing ball on the screen? Or are we eyes closed, hands uplifted, looking into the face of God? Or as one of the old choruses used to say, look into his marvelous face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. All of this is to ask the question, are we inviting visitors to church or to Jesus? Is our church about church or is our church about Jesus? If everything we do saying look towards Jesus and who he is, that he is the son of God, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is eternity, says the Father will draw all men to himself. When this is settled and other things fall into place and we begin to live a life not of legalism or pseudo-Christian psychology, but of grace and mercy, I think there'll be growth. The values of the church become ingrained as the love of God is made manifest. These are, there are many other issues in building a church and hopefully we can address some of them. Discipleship is a big topic and very important uh, in making disciples of all of us. I want to be made more into a disciple. And let me just say, it's not easy work. So don't get discouraged. Be encouraged. God's on your side. It's God's work. And you will have the Holy Spirit working in you and with you. Water, plant. But most importantly... Stay in prayer. I'll be back with you on uh, this, my now growing website, and uh, you'll be able to find me. And uh, if you have some topics that I'd like to address, you can email me or uh, message me on uh, Facebook Messenger, and I'll try to take a look at uh, saying something about it. Uh, God bless you.